which have belongs to English. I think the majesty of I will speak in English, but that but English is false language. We are much more comfortable talking in English than this in our own mother tongue. This country has official Asia languages. Asia is becoming English. English is a very difficult language. We have been trying to revitalize our language. A high proportion of all internet transmissions English are in English. English is the universal Something language. Something like a quarter of the world's world. population well, speak English now. choose to go to the moon in this decade because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Roger. I got three fuel cell lights and HD bus light and fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. Houston, try FCE to auxiliary over. The 20th century witnessed the greatest period of scientific advance in recorded history. Fueled by the economic power of Britain's Industrial Revolution and America's subsequent development into the world's most powerful industrial nation, the English-speaking world became the center of a scientific renaissance, and English the language of scientific communication and discovery. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One of the reasons why English became a global language is without a doubt the fact that it became the medium of expression for so much scientific and technological development. Something like half or two-thirds of the scientists and technologists who made that revolution worked through the medium of English. And what this meant, of course, was that if you, want, if you were interested in, uh, in, in the new techniques of road building or steam locomotion or textiles and you were on the continent of Europe, you had to come to England to find out about these things. Uh, you had to learn how to build the machines. The maintenance instructions were in English. You had to learn English in order to acquire the knowledge that the science and technology made available to you. If you now look at the vocabulary of modern English, Something like three quarters of that vocabulary is scientific or technological. Um, the terminology of chemistry, the terminology of botany, the terminology of medicine. Uh, this is all English vocabulary, English in a sense. Of course, it all came from Latin and Greek uh, and, and, and were, were amalgams of other languages. But the, the vocabulary of English became the dominant voice of science and technology very, very quickly. Of all major inventions, the computer is the first to expend not the strength of man's muscles, but the power of his brain. Nowhere has the importance of English been more evident than in the development of the computer and its subsequent growth into the Internet. The language of discourse during the development of the Internet was indeed English, and the uh, software implementations used English as a basic uh, language because the bulk of the users, in fact, uh, were English-speaking. So it's no surprise that uh, most of its uh, manifestation showed uh, in English language formats. There's no question that English is right now the dominant language on the internet. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of the discourse on the internet is carried out in English. And you hear, on the one hand, this kind of triumphalist, smug pride on the part of Anglophones sometimes about the internet as another road down which English will march on its inevitable course of world conquest. And on the other hand, you hear from the French or the Russians or the Germans cries of alarm. President Chirac of France called English domination of the Internet a major risk for humanity. Not French humanity, but that goes without saying. The statistics illustrate that English was the original language of the Internet, still the dominant voice of the Internet. But of course, its proportion is steadily falling as increasing numbers of countries come online. A high proportion of all internet transmissions are in English. Um, for a while, it was well over 90%. Now there are more channels using local languages, but I think that helps spread English as well. English is an internet language. English is a language of instructions. We're coining the new words for the web. I think the web will also keep alive a lot of dying little languages that only have 10 speakers anywhere in the world. They'll find each other and they'll email constantly, but at the same time they'll be exposed through their search engines to this enormous wealth of English language-oriented culture.
On the internet, English speakers can now enjoy unimagined sources of information and access the collections of universities and national libraries in ways once only possible for the privileged. The Library of Congress is probably the largest collection of information and knowledge in recorded history. Basically what has happened over 200 years of the library, we've been collecting and systematically organizing a record of the world's cultural and intellectual output. Libraries were originally founded on the notion that you'd have all this stuff in one place in one time, and people would then come to use it there. Now, thanks to new technologies, for the first time, we're able to bring this to people rather than having people come here. So we've created something called the National Digital Library, which is on our website. And we have loaded uh, approximately five million items from our collections uh, onto this site. There's movies, there are uh, audio clips, photographs, prints, just a wide variety of special formats. And the idea is that after years of having to make a pilgrimage to Washington to come and use this material, this material can now come to you. One of the areas that we first did was the American Memory Project. And this, this was to put uh, primarily American uh, materials. So you go on our homepage and click to American Memory. And then if you want to just skip to today in history, this is a little feature where we've taken things out of the collection and tells you what happened on a certain day together with uh, some examples. Here's a panoramic photograph that uh, you can then zoom in and some of these things are just filled with all sorts of information about industrial history or, or society or culture and fashion and all that. While the digital library may question the traditional means of accessing information, for many, the experience of reading is still inextricably associated with books. At the British Library in London, digital technology is being utilized to bring priceless texts into the hands of the public. What we've done is to make digital images of six so far of our greatest treasures. We have here the Diamond Sutra, and if you touch the screen, this brings up the original scroll. Touch the screen again, and it begins to unroll. It's the earliest piece of dated printing known to have survived in the world, and it comes from the 9th century, from ancient China. This is a chant of the text of the original Buddhist devotional work. That was created for us by monks in Taiwan. Now, the other thing that we can do with this is uh, we can zoom in on a particular part of the manuscript or treasure. Here you can really see close up the artistry of the original print or manuscript. Now, there are many different examples. Uh, let me show you an example of a book. Um, this is the Lateral Psalter a devotional work of psalms created for a wealthy family in the late 13th, very early 14th century. And if we open it up, beginning with the book plate that shows who it belonged to before it came to the British Library, if you turn some more pages, you come to jousting scenes, um, some rather challenging performance art, the other thing that really fascinates me about this technology is that you can look in such fine detail at the way the scribes and the artists actually made the manuscript. The possibilities offered by digital access to information promise to change the nature of libraries, but their existence in cyberspace may ultimately be limited. It is fundamentally changing the nature of what a library is in the sense that more and more people are turning first to the internet. But I cannot myself foresee a time when any library could afford to digitize more than a small proportion of all the material it holds. We worked out once not long ago that it would take all of the British Library's two and a half thousand staff 400 years 
to digitize the holdings that we have here at the moment. But while the high-tech resources which the internet offers to people in developed cultures grow apace, large portions of the world remain excluded from the digital revolution through poverty and a lack of technological infrastructure. There's an infrastructure problem in Africa. There are no telephones. Someone said the majority of African people have never made a telephone call. There is some statistic that says that there are more telephone calls in Manhattan, in New York, than in the rest of the continent. So even before we get to the debate about whether English is influencing the internet users, there's a problem that people cannot even access the internet. Unless you do something yourself, you don't internalize it. It doesn't become a part of your understanding and your normal daily affairs. And so the most successful efforts that I've seen in uh, bridging the digital divide have been efforts that teach people in countries where internet hasn't spread how to operate pieces of the internet and how to make it a business. As more of the global economy goes online, the issue of exclusion from the internet has potentially disastrous implications for countries like South Africa. There's this perception that people still have about computers and the internet that uh, it has been created to, to sustain, for an example, oppressive systems and so forth and so on. People think that these computers are meant to take away what they used to do, and that is thinking. We, we need to demystify that process so that people could be able to, to start appreciating the use and the assistance that the system could bring to them. In a grassroots effort to bridge the digital divide, the South African government has established the .za initiative to bring internet access to some of the poorest people in the society. The basic intentions of the center is to allow communities who are from disadvantaged backgrounds to have access to computer resources, uh, to also be able to get information through the internet and, and use that information to uplift the standard of living in uh, semi-rural communities and uh, what we previously called uh, shanty towns. The difficulties of bringing IT to a poor part of Africa are vividly illustrated here in Tembisa on the outskirts of Johannesburg. Dot ZA's electrical power cable has been stolen and a temporary generator has to be brought in. Firstly, all the people that are, are running the center are people who are literate when it comes to the English language. But also secondly, the students that we get. We always make sure that uh, although they might not have a proper command of the language, but at least they have the basic knowledge of the language, such that when they use the system, they're able to interpret various things and be able to, to access various information and be able to use that information. We think that with the sort of high um, non-employment rate in the country, people could be able to get job opportunities through the internet and so forth and so on. So it is important. It's, it's very important for people to have access to such information. Many visitors to the center are disappointed though, as the generator only creates enough power to run three computers. We hope that uh, by the end of the year, some of the centers would have been established in other communities. We, we believe that it's very important in the sense that um, we, we have to increase the number of people who have access to information because it, that is the only way in which you can be able to deal with other societal problems such as crime, um, illiteracy rate and so forth and so on. In many respects, India faces similar problems to South Africa, with the majority of its one billion people having little opportunity to access the technology of the internet. However, the adoption of English as a second language by a large proportion of its middle class has given India a unique and unexpected advantage in the field of IT. There is no doubt at all that English has a lot to do with the progress that India has made in the area of IT. English is the universal language in high tech and if India has to succeed in high tech, India has to embrace English. India has, as you know, large population, um, nearly a billion and we have a very 
strong and good uh, education system. We produce over 100,000 engineers a year. Because we miss the Industrial Revolution, the Indian intellectual has always been very comfortable with conceptualization, with pen and paper, with algorithmics. Now, this is one area which affords considerable opportunity for exercising the power of intellect just using algorithms, using concepts, using ideas, using, using uh, instructions. Even if you looked at a small percentage of Indians uh, having the expertise in terms of conceptualization, even if you looked at it's only 1%, you're talking of 10 million people. Now, we believe that India's strength at this point in time is in producing a large number of English-speaking technical talent. The inevitable consequence of this is that India is losing some of its brightest IT graduates to foreign companies. Foreign companies can now come to uh, Indian universities and recruit them directly, and that's competition for us. When Americans come and wave the dollars and we wave the rupees, then you know who, which side of the students will take. The upside to that is these guys get exposed to all the new developments that happens in the UK, US and other places, and they would bring that know-how back into India. But while India's English-speaking software engineers migrate to Silicon Valley, America's continued technological domination of the digital world is by no means assured. I happen to think of the US happens to be a third world country when it comes to wireless communication. I mean, Europe and Asia are far ahead of the United States. So it is conceivable to me that the last 10 years has been kind of the pinnacle of, of uh, technology prowess for the United States. But you may actually see countries like Japan uh, being the leading edge in terms of playing into how the wireless media actually impact how teenagers think, how teenagers communicate. In Japan in particular, there is a very, very rapid growth of internet access by means of mobile telephones. Something like uh, 16 million of these devices have been sold in the last 15 to 18 months in Japan, so it's very popular, especially among teenagers. The immense popularity of mobile phone internet access among Japanese teenagers has led electronics giant Sony to consider an even more ambitious development for the wireless internet. We start thinking about the future of broadcasting. And as you know in Japan, broadcasting, uh, younger people really get tired of it. And the people are more and more inclined and going into the, their cellular phone. And they talk, they watch, they do about everything on this. So then why not? make uh, content for this size. Then something come into my mind. Let's make three minutes content. Within that three minutes, we can put almost everything, sports, drama, everything. Simultaneously, we broadcast the same content on the internet screen. We have 10 characters, covers our lifestyle totally. Yeah! So even 10 years old, boys can understand the philosophy. There is an obsession with creating the next cool thing that actually tries to help people's lives. More maybe emphasis on cool things and helping people's lives. We tend to get those sometimes confused. Um, but when you create a cool thing, that cool thing propagates by itself, and the way that we talk about that cool thing moves with the artifact itself. After all, culture does grow up around artifacts. Well, in today's world, many of those artifacts are technological artifacts. Some, Okay, check the news. Although Sonet currently broadcasts in Japanese, access to wider audiences will inevitably require change. My final goal is making the three-minute content in English. Not high sophisticated English, but English I like my you know language I speak. So by watching that three minutes, they can imagine what's going on. With a very limited English assistance, 
I think as we move to broadband communication, you're going to find a notion of literacy shifting from just being text-based literacy to text plus image-type literacy and screen-based literacy and so on. Multimedia is, by the way, multiple media um, and has multiple kinds of literacy combined. I think we're going to be inventing genres you can't even believe right now. But even if the future internet moves away from text to more visual forms, the issues of language and accessibility remain. So can we look forward to the day when computers will solve this problem too? People say that we're going to have perfected machine translation in 15 years. And they've been saying that same thing since 1960. And in the year 2050, I think they're going to be saying just 15 years from now, we'll have got it down. It's an enormously difficult problem to translate not just poetry, which resists translation, but the simplest text. If you, if you want to say remove the spark plug in German, you use one verb. If you're saying remove the fan belt, you use another verb. If you're saying remove the uh, uh, carburetor, you use another verb. And that's very difficult for a machine to master. There are, however, less sophisticated systems currently available on the internet. And at British Telecom's research center at Astral Park, Another step is being taken towards the ultimate goal. We're developing a machine translation system called PenPal, and it's different to most other translation systems in that it tries to get at the meaning behind text and not just process it in a very superficial way. When you type in a sentence, it analyzes the sentence to check for ambiguities. If I click on the word I here, it asks whether I am male or female, because that could be important to translation. The word C could have several meanings. In this case, we mean perceived by sight, but it could say be a doctor seeing a patient, in which case it might be a different translation in different languages. It wants to know whether cat is male or female, and that might have an effect too on the translation. It's now got an unambiguous representation of this phrase, and there's the translation into French. It's currently an experimental system. Uh, we haven't reached the prototype stage yet, really, um, but we would like to productize it if possible or incorporate it into other systems where it could be useful for anybody trying to communicate with somebody that doesn't speak the same language as them. The technology can do amazing things, and it's already being used by lots of people who can make do with something less than a perfect translation. If I go on the internet and I want to find out if a hotel in Milan takes visa cards, if I receive a letter from somebody in Greece uh, that I don't know how to under, uh, translate, I can at least get an idea of what the, what the letter's about. And I think those uses of the technology will continue to spread. The technology will improve. But if we're looking for a, a perfect colloquial translation from Chinese to English or Greek to German, I don't see that happening at any time in the next 50, 60, 70 years. I mean, what's an eternity uh, given the, the, the rate of development of the technology? In the meantime, even the English-speaking world is coming to accept the fact that in order to communicate effectively, the future has to be multilingual. The world is moving towards an increasingly multilingual future. The most obvious benefit is that it enables you to see the world from a number of different points of view. And it makes you a, a more open-minded individual. There's no shadow of a doubt about that. As one assimilates the culture, you, you become part of it and you suddenly see that your own way is just one way of many ways of seeing the world. It is an immensely strong force for tolerance. The BBC World Service was the first global English language broadcaster. They now produce programmes in 43 languages, a policy which enables them to connect with their audience far more effectively. We broadcast because we think free information is a sort of an important aspect of, of democracy. Uh, and that has to be, a, again, one of the sort of touchstones of what we do. Different countries go through different situations which make what we do more important or less important to them. So if you look at, say, Afghanistan currently, uh, almost every adult Afghan listens to the BBC in either Persian or Pushtu because nobody else is broadcasting the range of information that we give. Because we speak in a local language fine if somebody is not educated and can therefore not speak or hear English, they are able to, you know, listen to BBC material without necessarily having to understand English. So yes, in that way we cater for an audience which 
English would not have been able to reach. For the World Service, foreign language broadcasts have become an essential complement to their English language service and an important recognition of the value of multilingualism. It is a policy which is now attracting other international broadcasters. CNN too have begun producing regional language programming, which enables them to focus on local issues alongside their English language international service. We realized maybe five or six years ago it was no longer possible to have one single global version of CNN going out to all parts, to all men, to all women, not possible. We had to produce international news through regional eyeballs and to swoop down into local language, and that's been the strategy for the last three or four years. We have a Spanish uh, language channel for Latin America, uh, a version for Mexico. We have a 24-hour Spanish channel in Spain itself. We are a majority shareholder of a German language version of CNN in Germany. Guten Abend und herzlich willkommen bei CNN Deutschland. Mein Name ist Brigitte Reimann. We have CNN Turk, which broadcasts 24 hours a day in Turkey, and several other plans at the moment for other television versions of CNN. And we have you know, nine or ten versions of CNN on the website, and we'll be doubling that number in the next six to 12 months. CNN.co.jp. Up to the minute news from CNN in Japanese. Log on today. But ironically, the increasing availability of local language programming has had little impact on the growth of English as a lingua franca. In Asia, the move towards becoming bilingual in English has been enthusiastically embraced. There are now more people learning English as a foreign language in China than there are native speakers in America. And in Japan, where English has traditionally been regarded as a threat to Japanese culture, there is a growing focus on the importance of acquiring the language. Asia is becoming English-speaking Asia very much rapidly. And yet, if Japan would just seclude itself uh, and just want to maintain its purity, quote-unquote, uh, then how can Japan communicate with the neighboring countries and societies? English is not just uh, Anglo-Saxon English these days. English has become to be second language for many societies. Japan currently has one of the lowest levels of English literacy in Asia and has begun to recognize the potential cost to its economy if bilingualism isn't encouraged. In Tokyo, the Foreign Press Association recently hosted a conference to discuss the economic importance of English as a common language in the region. There's a kind of a panic in Japan over English and a real sense of crisis that didn't exist before. And English always played a big role in Japan, but Japan has a kind of a translation culture where it takes what it wants from the West and translates it into Japanese, or it takes everything it thinks it needs and translates it into Japanese. But Japan can't communicate its views effectively because there aren't enough people who can do that fluently in English. There was a Japanese professor at Keio who said, you know, we shouldn't have to apologize for using Japanese English. The notion that English belongs to the Americans or Britons is narrow-minded. English is now the language of the world. And so people are saying, you know, it belongs to us and we will change it and use it. You don't want everybody to speak British accent or American accent. It's good to, to have uh, Thai accent, Indonesian accent, Japanese accent. But when they get together, they speak in the English that is intelligible because you need to have identity of the speaker. You don't want to have Asian face and then everybody speak Oxbridge accent. The number of non-native speakers has really uh, boomed and, and, and have taken the language for themselves and they say, you know, this is our language and we're going to change it and use it. Um, so, so that has definitely taken place and I think that American English or British English, you know, it was the starting point. It's no longer the standard. I have a, a question for our other panelists about Chinese. There are three times as many Chinese speakers in the world as, as English speakers. And I wonder if Chinese could become uh, the lingua franca in Asia. I, I, I appreciate the nice thought, but I don't think it'll happen. 
it's a very, very laborious task for non uh, Chinese uh, to learn Chinese characters. And you cannot just uh, learn that language uh, w- uh, without learning Chinese characters. So I think that this is, um, I think, a serious block uh, uh, inhibition. I don't think Chinese uh, will become uh, lingua franca. To not have a elf- not have alphabets is a big problem, you know, for the Chinese. I mean, how do you sort? I mean, we're talking about IT, right? I can't even organize my phone book in Chinese. Do you go by strokes? You know, you, you, you can order. So when you can order, you can sort. Right? and becomes very inefficient. I think we're moving towards a bilingual and multicultural the world. Um, United States itself, uh, which has been quite insular in terms of language, um, is promoting more multilingual, uh, also multicultural values. And so there's a convergence. We thought that we had this huge advantage being native speakers of English, and now uh, with so many people bilingual around the world, and with English having changed, that unless Americans are also bilingual, we're not going to be able to to communicate. In this day and age, you have to accept the fact that we need a language through which you should be able to communicate with an increasing uh, number of people. And if your language is not the one, and unluckily Japanese isn't the language, then uh, the only way you can uh, expand your horizon is to, uh, is to learn another language. And uh, I'm probably uh, a bit sorry it has to be English because, as I said, it is not an easy language to learn. But if it were Swedish or French or German, you know, those languages might have their own peculiarities that would make us uh, difficult to learn. English language education has in fact been a regular feature in the Japanese curriculum since the end of the Second World War. However, teaching methods have relied on grammatical instruction with little attention paid to the spoken language. The problem is they're still using the grammar translation system. It has never changed in all these years. You come into after graduation, they have six years of English in the high school system, but they still can't speak English. They understand, but they can't say it. Tom Trinkle is one of a growing number of language teachers working in the private sector in Japan trying to raise the standards of spoken English. Okay. All right, practice as a partner. You come here, you're doing five, six hours a day, every day, and uh, we're going, what, six months? And their English was fine. Very, they can carry a conversation with you. I, I, but I'd like to get her something different this time. Have you, have you, girl, have you considered buying a jewelry for her birthday? That's an idea. For me, my life is this school and my students. And my family is very much a part of what I do. They're excited to talk to my children because my children are bilingual, bicultural. They are what the students want to be. Uh, what do you usually give your mother for her birthday? Uh, sometimes a box, box of chocolate, sometimes flowers. I went to the university 1970-71. I had an old Japanese teacher who told me Japanese is a dying language. And this was an old Japanese woman. And she said, today, there is no more new kanji. All the new words coming into the language are foreign words. So what I see is more and more the influence of uh, foreign culture coming into Japan. So what's the difference? Can I help you? May I help you? Uh, we use made. I don't know. you. We use may uh, more polite. I think. Oh, that's an idea. For foreigners like myself, English is a very difficult language to perfect because it has so many exceptions to the rule and the spelling is, is impossible. So learning a language, uh, learning a foreign language, is like learning a completely different uh, framework, separate from your own, and that's quite challenging. In Osaka, 
the Doshisha Women's College has been staging an annual Shakespeare production for the past 50 years. Students studying English tackle the language in its most complex form, producing a unique amalgam of Japanese culture and 16th century English. That's a formidable tradition, doing Shakespeare in English in Japan. This was started uh, 50 years ago, as you know, the, by the teachers, and they thought it's a good idea to let the students perform a part of uh, the play they were reading at the time. It's much more fun and much more easy to understand by performing Shakespeare than just reading in a classroom. Gentle sing again. My knee is much enamored of thy note, so it's my long and fro to thy shape. They are fourth year students, so uh, they have a good background in English. To swear, I love thee. I played bottom. I had to be the most masculine man in the play so that I could be stupid without any of the juice of the flower. I play Hippolyta and Titania. Ha! Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, <laughs> with purple grapes, green figs and a monk. Mm. Yes, it's very difficult for me to speak classical English. Language is like not familiar. It's too old and it's something you never speak, so all I had to do was to just memorize in the text. I wanted to speak out in a modern way like you people do, so <laughs> I didn't want to make it sound old. <laughs> Shakespeare is the basis of modern English in many ways. You find many expressions in modern English uh, which Shakespeare himself used or invented. Not the elders and do him courtesies. To get into the world of Shakespeare is very good for their modern English training. Good night unto you all. Give me your hand. If we be friends, and Bobby shall be sought. Amen. While millions around the world struggle with the daunting task of learning English, the benefits of bilingualism have begun to be appreciated in Britain, the home of the language. In these valleys, one of the most successful revivals of a minority language is being enthusiastically pursued. For the people of Wales, the future is determinately bilingual. This is one of the success stories of the 20th century. In the case of Welsh, we have both a strong grassroots movement, which began in the 60s and 70s, which led eventually to the provision of a Welsh language television channel and all sorts of other good things. And then, top-down, the government has introduced two language acts and there is some movement uh, towards a third, aiming to protect the language. As a consequence, Welsh is the only Celtic language in the 20th century to have stopped its steady decline down towards going through the floor, to have evened out and actually to show signs of growth. An integral part of the language revival was the introduction of Welsh language acts, which gave the language official status in government and legally established a bilingual society. Welsh has been the language of Wales for very many centuries, has certainly been around longer than English has in this part of the United Kingdom. There are also benefits, I think, in terms of cultural diversity, that people realise that most people in the world are bilingual. Uh, many of them have English as their, as their second language, but many are bilingual in, in other languages. And that, in the sense that it opens one's windows on the world, the advantages it gives, the appreciation of diversity that that creates, we think are all positive benefits. So, Jack Kettle, 
We tend to sort of drown them in Welsh. The children don't understand, of course, we translate, but um, all formal education is done through the medium of Welsh, and it's surprising how the children pick the language up. You have two different cultures, two different traditions. You have all the poetry in English and Welsh that they can appreciate, and there's all the extra knowledge they get. It's exactly like looking at the world through two different windows. But it is a constant battle. Um, we have to work very, very hard to make sure that the children are bilingual. And the parents are very supportive in this area. I understand from the nursery that she can understand through the medium of Welsh, but um, her vocabulary at the moment is quite limited. So it would be things like colours, numbers, thank you, please. Um, and occasionally she's talking to herself, and she's definitely talking in Welsh, but at the moment I don't understand what she's saying. Bilingual education really has only become a reality in Wales during the last half of the 20th century. But by now... Bilingual education is within grasp of people in, in all parts of Wales and the demand for bilingual education is encouraging. The media has also played a crucial role in the promotion of the Welsh language. This is the set of Publicum. This is actually the BBC's longest running soap opera. It's in the Welsh language. It's produced here by BBC Wales here in Cardiff. Venna! 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 Okay, I'm sure it's some of the added today. Are here, yeah? Some of the and action. BBC Wales was the pioneer in, in, in broadcasting in the Welsh language, and since um, 1982, with the creation of, of the Welsh language channel, all of that programming has appeared on that channel. And then on radio, we have our own radio service. Uh, it's a full 18 hour a day radio service, and uh, that's all in the Welsh language. So uh, that commitment is pretty solid. The success of the Welsh in establishing a bilingual society reflects a firm commitment to a cultural heritage which happily coexists alongside an acceptance of the usefulness of English. In South Africa, with its 11 official languages, this process is much further advanced, with multilingualism a practical reality. If you go to Africa where people speak four or five languages, they don't use them for the same purpose. They use one language in the home, another language perhaps in the street, another language if they go to church, another language perhaps in, uh, in some political arena, uh, and so on and so forth. They use the different languages for different purposes. That's what multilingualism is really like. This situation is aptly reflected in South Africa's most popular soap opera, Isidingo, which is produced, directed and acted by a multiracial, multilingual team. In the programme, characters converse in a bewildering hybrid of languages that reflect the reality of South African life. Very good stuff. Today. Okay. We can cut. That's good. You can play it down a lot more. Okay. You know, as in, uh, if we had only one language in this program, it would feel unprotected with other languages. Now, it is good that it has other languages in, which, of course, there is that protection. We, we know, we know there is this language uh, uh, spoken in, the, in this program, this and that and that. It's Zulu Kosa, so to, you know, total English, and it balances. So what the program does is it wants to tap into almost all languages and tap in on everybody else so that people know that even if there's lots of English in it, but somewhere my language is going to be spoken and something in the way that I appreciate is going to be said. Hello, Wena. Who says you so stock stay for you? Huh? Go get the drinks and the food, man. Go, Tamaya, Hamba. Move. Rujo Mara man. Thank you. 
Thank you. The type of character he is is um, the wise guy. He speaks almost every language, but mostly that language that he uses is the uh, strict language that we call Tsotsitalo, which is a mixture of Africans and every other language. For example, my baby, when say my baby, says, hey, me bambino, you know, and bambino is not the English language, you know, it's what, is it Italian or French? You know, it's things like, uh, comprehend it, if you stand me like then do you understand? Slow. Last week was a bumper week. What's that? No, Hey, show boss. He uses Tswana, he uses Zulu, and English. So, uh, the more comfortable he is with any language, he goes with it. Hey. Oh, Marisa, I just had some interesting news. Oh. Lorraine, doesn't that close door mean anything to you? Kira, Koko. There's a lot more confidence coming from people who are speaking the minority languages to use those languages whenever they feel like it. And it's then the prerogative of the other person to say, I'm not with you, can you say that again in another language? Um, which puts the power back to the, in the hands of the people with the minority language. Standing there, you might as well just... <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be great if you could stand. Sometimes it's quite tricky when people start to need to ad-lib and you've got a director who doesn't understand all the vernacular, you're in trouble, and that's really our problem. We should be um, more clued up with languages because, in fact, our black actors all are perfectly, uh, understand Afrikaans and English perfectly well, and so we're the ones that are f further behind. But I must say, one gets used to it, and after a while, you start to understand, although you don't know the language, because there's certain no, stock expressions, and you, we start using them badly. And so we've accommodated for that um, <laughs> over, over time. Every time we meet people in the street, say, you said something the other day, and I really like it. It's true, this is what happens in my culture. And once you tell stories that are South African about South Africans, they love them more. And I think that's what makes Isidingo tick so much with people. I love you. I can't live without you. The sooner it's legal, the better. The English spoken by the characters on Isidingo, with its diverse local vocabulary, is typical of the many varieties of the language that are springing up around the world. With native speakers of English now in the minority, is the language destined to fragment into mutually unintelligible dialects? And if so, what place does English have in our globalized world? It's interesting, there are almost two Englishes. There's this, the English that we Americans speak for the most part, and the British speak and so on, that's a native language that has a rich literature and that we think we own in some sense. And then there's this other English. I, I, when I lived in Rome, I used to think of it as Euro-English, though I suppose I should think of it as world English. And it was sort of like the Euro-dollar, this currency that had burst forth from its national boundaries and was establishing a life of its own. I, I'd sit in the Piazza Navona and watch some Italian guys hitting on some Danish women who were tourists there, speaking this English that, that I, I had no possible way of understanding, but that seemed to work for them. And, and there is a sense in which uh, the effectiveness of English as a world language has to a certain extent profited from the fact that English speakers really tend to be less intense about protecting its correctness than, say, the French are. English should be now looked as an Indian language. It's no longer a foreign language. It's a language which we have grown up with. We have twisted it. We speak it in our own way. It's as much my language as the language of the guy who is there in England. And the world is perhaps richer with this language, and I think English is here to stay, and I think that is going to be resonating in the hearts for a long, long time. I still have to find out why uh, the English have been able to con the world uh, 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 like this, but uh, that is the reality. Um, uh, whether you are in Russia or in China or in Japan or in the U.S., um, wherever you go, you will be able to, to log on in English and get onto some website and update yourself about what has happened in the world. Nobody can predict the future of the English language or of any language, really, but English in particular. There has never been a language spoken by so many people in so many places. There has never been a language that has been subjected to so many influences by so many people in so many places. I see the future of English as being a world where everybody will be developing multi-dialectism 
in the English language. It'll be a much more varied kind of English, uh, still a very universal English, but one in which there is a balance between intelligibility and identity. One thing is clear. Whatever the fate of English, it is now a world language that belongs to all of the billion or more people who use it every day, and who, through their daily discourse, contribute to its immense richness and diversity.